of my badge. Um, welcome to our Merlin 25. It's a V12 27 litre, 1610 horsepower. The sort of thing you'd love on the long big car, but you need a big petrol tank to go with it. Um, from a crashed bomber, the fighter bomber 6, the yeah, one behind me. Um, <coughs> luckily, it crashed left into a boggy land, hence our guys, when it was dug up, and I'll cover that, um, I restored it. This end was a propeller. Sorry? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I'll get over here. That will, you'll hear that over there. Over here. Um, <coughs> the far end was where the supercharger was. It was a two speed single stage supercharger propeller this end. Uh, it was actually made for um, Mosquito Fighter Bomber 6 HJ17. There's a picture of it, it's a mosquito. Um, I'll cover again a bit more on that case. But let's step back and talk about the background for the Merlin engine. Rolls Royce, of course, um, who were founded in 1904, and they first started producing cars, French cars, under license. So, it, of course, then they realised they could build better quality cars, and that's history. Interesting, in the First World War, the government approached Rolls-Royce. They, they saw the future of aircraft in warfare, and uh, with Rolls-Royce's quality reputation for cars, they asked them if they could look at developing engines for uh, um, uh, aircraft uh, during the war. Um, and they produced uh, Vulture um, and the Vickers Viney. That was the. Sorry? Sorry, sorry. They were. They, they, they produced a number of engines. One of them was the Vickers Viney bomber, which uh, didn't actually see action during the First World War, but it was the first aircraft to fly across the Atlantic flown by Orcock and Brown. Just made it, it, it crash landed in an Irish bomb, but they made it. Um, in the interwar years, there was the, you may have, some of you may have heard of the Schneider Trophy. It was an air race over a fixed distance of single engine, engine seaplanes. And they started off as it was in the 19, uh, 19, oh, uh, 1913. Uh, and you had biplane, seaplane. But the, it's, it's like a lot of things, um, things like races or warfare, you get development uh, of aircraft and engines accelerates. Um, and the Schneider Trophy, the country that wins the, the race three consecutive times, they keep the trophy itself. And you had America, Italy, France, the UK, even Switzerland uh, entered. Um, the UK had won it once, the Americans I think it twice, and the, and the Italians twice. And <clears throat> the UK government, and it was at that time, the, the team for the Schneider race was backed by the British government. Um, <clears throat> and they approached Supermarine, uh, because they, they were in developing quite modern air aircraft at the time and asked if they could enter the race and, and, and produce a, an aircraft for that. And they developed the Supermarine S5, which was a monoplane, very sleek looking. Um, and that came second. Um, <coughs> there was the worry that uh, if, the, if some of the other contestants won again, they would win the trophy. So um, Supermarine approached Rolls-Royce and of course, it was Mitchell who designed the Spitfire, designed these, these S5. And Rolls-Royce was developing an engine. Uh, it was the Rolls-Royce R engine, probably one of the most powerful of its, of its time. And that was put into the Supermarine S6, uh, which won the race. And that, so UK had, uh, were looking then to, to win it consecutively. Um, the 6B was the next, next iteration, and they won it with that now. Or, it's interesting, the government was going to pull their support for the team, and it was um, a very rich lady, UK, 
put money into it, £10,000 helped them. Um, in the end, the UK won it again the third time, and it sits in the UK. But that's the background to the Rolls-Royce Merlin, which is probably the most famous aircraft engine in the world. Um, and there is more produced of Merlins uh, than probably ever any other engine that has been in, in the, um, uh, 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 produced it in, in flight. Now this particular one was HJ 719, which was uh, a night fighter before the time of airborne radar, but also had a ranger uh, task, which is literally low flying across Europe, picking out targets. Um, and the first pilot was an American, and it was 418 Squadron. He had been persuaded to join over, I think it was more than a few pints, by a friend of his who was a, a a Canadian uh, mosquito pilot and you can see that there is a picture of you can guess who the Americans are if you look at the picture there okay if you notice in the background on the aircraft nose there is a cartoon now, of course the RF didn't do that sort of thing but this is American Canadian and it's interesting uh, it's uh, a moon a, sorry, a pipe smoking gun poking uh, hillbilly gal from the Little Abner cartoon series. Um, Lou Luma, in fact, was the, he had 30 operations, ranger operations, uh, and he was the top uh, um, scorer of, uh, of an American pilot of the Peter. In 1940, that, that, the HJ-719 was built in 1943, with 418 squadron based at four in Sussex. Um, the next pilot was, uh, it was Warrant Officer McGill. There he is, very young looking. They were in those days. And his uh, observer partner co pilot was right off the story. Now, uh, they were on, in June 1944, they're in operations over the Channel. And what they were looking out for, and it was a night operation, they're looking for these beasties, the V1 Doodlebug, first of the guided bombs used in warfare. Now, they're, they're looking for it at night, a greater opportunity from the point of view that the jet plume out the back, you could see that in the dark. And what they would do, because these flew in about 400 miles an hour, between three and four thousand feet up. The mosquitoes would go at five thousand feet and keep a lookout for the, the jet plume. They, they would dive down, get the speed up, and uh, shoot from underneath. The idea of underneath the explosion is about half a ton of explosive in the nose. The, the, the theory was the debris would go behind them. They missed the first two. The third one they got. Unfortunately, the debris hit them in the starboard engine, this engine, which caught fire. Um, now, <coughs> they felt they, they had a problem. They were probably going to have to uh, <coughs> jump out of the aircraft. And as a statement here from uh, the, the pilot that it was at night over the channel. They didn't fancy jumping out over the channel. So they... <coughs> got onto the control tower, but they were guided by radar to tell them when they're over uh, the coast. They felt they had the right height because their momentum going up from the dive would get them into a reasonable height to glide back. They had the one engine. The port engine, unfortunately, had problems. The feathering of the propeller, they had to turn that engine off. So they obviously put the nose down and to, to get the speed up. By the time they were told they were actually over the coast, they were about three or four hundred feet, uh, getting lower. Uh, they had to kick open the hatch to get out because that was damaged. And he says in, in his letter here, he jumped out at about 200 feet. And he landed quite hard, uh, damaged his leg, but he survived, both of them survived. Unfortunately, he landed near the, the mosquito, which the which crash-landed into boggy land in Upper Beading, 
just northeast of, of Shoreham. Um, he had obviously waited until the explosives had finished before he, he, he got help. In the 1990s, the mosquito was um, dug up by historical archaeologists. They obviously knew where this had crashed. And there's pictures here you can see afterwards of the, the site and the, uh, the, 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 the processes they went through. Our guy had the, we had this engine for a few years before the guys said, we do a restoration, let's see if we can get it running. And let's show you. I'm just amazed when you consider how hard, hard it hit the ground. Good old Rolls Royce. <laughs> My point of view, I said, a tr tremendous educational tool for young kids. It's an engine, but it's an aircraft or a car engine. It's got the pistons, it's got the cylinders, overhead cam, spark plugs. It's an engine. Any questions? Can I throw one at you? Okay. If you look at the development of the Merlin, uh, it's so successful. You had the Spitfire Hurricane, the Mosquito, the Lancaster Bomber. Bolton pulled the fire, the Wellington bomber, the Halifax. Um, and of course there was the uh, P-51 Mustang. Now if you look at when America came into the war, they had the Mustang, it had an Allison engine. Now it was a good engine, but not very good at altitude. Now of course the, uh, the Americans saw the Merlin engine which had been in uh, action for a number of years, a couple of years. So the American government uh, approached, first of all, Ford and asked them if they would um, build Merlin engines, if they got it under license to be built. They turned it down, so they approached Packard, which said, yep, and they closed their vehicle factory to make Merlin. Now, after they had gone through the fairly quick discussions, they got the blueprint. Now, Rolls-Royce's reputation, everything's got to be perfect. That doesn't fit, make another one. So it fits. Packard, of course, they used the production line techniques, and they said, this is no good for us to implement this. So they actually redrew, redrew the, the blueprint. They actually improved the engine. The, uh, the Merlin was uh, renowned for it, it leaks oil. They um, redesigned the, the block and it cut down the oil seepage. Now, I'll ask you then, I know because I had to look it up, someone asked the question, guess how many Merlins were built during the war? Merlins, that's uh, Packard and Rolls-Royce. Throw some guesses up. 20,000. 20,000, I hear it bump. The Merlin engine went into the Centurion Marcus Yeah, on the aircraft, yes. Yes, you're right. Yes. The, yeah. No, let's stick with the aircraft. Yes, you're right. 55,000, uh, that is the Packard. 112,000 Rolls Royce. More than I thought. Interesting, of course, you have the Griffin engine, which took over from this. But of course, by then, jets were coming in. So uh, there was one discussion last year and um, someone asked them, how many Griffin engines? Luckily, someone in the audience looked it up for me. There was eight, I think it was eight and a half thousand. But, you know, okay. You know, jets were around then, so it was, but yeah, you had it in the later uh, Spitfires. Um, and of course you had it in the, the Hornet, which was replaced the, 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 the Merlin. The uh, mosquito. Any? Yes, I can. All right, I'll do it. Remember, this is not on real oil. It's we've got to do first. Right. You ready? I'll try to get out of the way. Please. Interesting. 
we, we try to get the young kiddies involved in the museum. You know, of course, they get bored, the very young ones. So we started bringing in for holidays for little games and so on. And we have one of them, which is, I don't think it's out there yet for Easter. It's a mock-up of um, a pilot seat, you know. And there's a little thing you can press at the front. And at the back, this you slip some wooden discs. So you hit this at the front, they shoot out. And the kids have a, a net to catch them. They love it. <laughs> but I said, well, hang on a minute, can you... You know, kids can't come here. Can you imagine putting ping pong balls in there? <laughs> Sorry, but no one would listen to it. <laughs> any, any other questions? As I say, I'm trying to answer them. There was one, I, I will throw at you some of the questions. What's in the firing wall? I can tell you if you're interested. <laughs> but you can see the way it's finely balanced. You've got the exhaust and the fuel, the firing order. The holding is well balanced. Another classic question is, what the um, fuel consumption? It's a, 150 imperial gallons per hour on this one at the maximum economy. That's why, of course, you can see the fuel, external fuel tank for a long haul. You know, mosquitoes would fly to Berlin and back comfortably. Um, so, yes, but I find it just a remarkable, remarkable that it's turning over. Uh, I love it. <laughs> I love it. Uh, of course, if you really want... Oh, one thing I will do. I've seen over the years many operational reports from pilots. I have the one for the night they crashed. And here it is. Off, bailed out after both engines cut. Shame. <laughs> right. Brave men, very brave men, remarkable. But if you want, you can come up and see it. But thanks very much indeed for your time. Thank you. Do you want another quick turnover? Yeah, that'd be great. Right. I have to do it with that. With that sure. Up. Open this up if you want to come and have a look. And also the pictures of the crash site.